Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Thank you for joining us today for the webinar, Crypto Cops, What to Do When They Come for You, uh, presented by Baker Hostetler. I'm Teresa Goody-Guillen, and I'm a partner in the Washington, D.C. office, and I am being joined by Michelle Tanney uh, in the New York office and Veronica Reynolds in the Los Angeles office. So before we get started, there's just a few housekeeping items we want to bring to your attention. So this presentation will last an hour and is approved for, for one hour of continuing legal education credit in California, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Washington. Credit is also pending in Virginia and other states may be available if you request so. Please note the following if you're applying for CLE credit. There will be two slides with separate codes that will appear in the slide deck during the program. So please write down these codes and at the end of the webinar, you'll see a survey and just answer all the questions on the survey, include your bar number in your state. Um, and if you have any questions during the presentation, just click on the Q&A and type in your question and we're gonna do our best to answer them either throughout the program or at the end. And if not, uh, we'll follow up with you after the webinar, but please feel free to reach out to us as well. So first, I just wanna give you a brief introduction on who's gonna be speaking to you today. So um, as I said, Teresa Goody Guillen, I'm a partner in the DC office and uh, my practice straddles over both um, investigations and defense work. So oftentimes SEC defense work as well as other white collar work, as well as corporate work. Oftentimes my practice deals with the securities laws as I'm a securities lawyer. Um, so it just straddles both of those realms. And I've been actively involved in blockchain since 2015 um, and very active in the, the crypto blockchain, DeFi, NFT, Web3, general blockchain space as it evolves. Michelle Tanny um, is resident in our New York office and she's in the white collar group. She comes to us from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange Group and um, sorry, Mercantile Exchange Group. Uh, so she has CFT experience as well as um, general um, experience uh, in white collar and enforcement with the SEC and defense. Um, see how I can move the slides. I think it's gotta click on it. All right. And next, uh, Veronica Reynolds, she is from our uh, Los Angeles office, um, and she is very active and has been active in blockchain since um, before Ethereum launched. She actually founded UCLA Blockchain um, and is very active in all aspects and works on all matters involving um, blockchain, digital assets, NFTs, DeFi, Web3, um, and other things that I am still have to learn about. So. <laughs> Uh, sorry about that, going a little bit far in our... So um, today's program, we want to provide you a brief roadmap of what we're going to be going over today. Um, so just first, generally, some, some background on virtual currency and market concepts. We received a lot of inquiries about a general uh, introduction into this. And then we're going to get into the regulatory regime and the enforcement regime to include congressional involvement. Um, and then when the regulators come for you, how, what do you do? And how do you avoid those kinds of inquiries? And we'll finish up with our key takeaways and things we think you're the top tips that we would give you and some Q&A. So to start into our blockchain, um, for those of you who sent these inquiries in, we're responding and we are presenting now on the blockchain and digital assets, Ethereum and smart contracts, NFTs, stable coins, market concepts, and the general um, ecosystem and payment systems of blockchain. 
All right, thanks, Teresa, and welcome, everyone. So although the purpose of the presentation is enforcement in the digital asset space, as Teresa mentioned, we thought it would also be helpful to provide a primer on the industry and also speak on how these transactions are actually effectuated. So I'm going to skip briefly over the executive order and go straight into the graphic first to provide you a little bit of background on how these technologies function. Now, the graphic here gives a good overview of how each step in the process plays out. But starting all the way on the left, we see that the creation of digital assets is typically done by an issuer or through mining. Well, what does that mean? Crypto mining is actually a process by which new units of digital currency are created. Great, but it gets more complicated than that because it requires very high computing power to solve complex mathematical equations that verify transactions and add them to the blockchain digital letter. So in the case of, let's say, Bitcoin, um, mining is done by using that sophisticated hardware to solve these hash puzzles in order to verify blocks of transactions. And it's actually a competitive process because if it's successful, then the miner is rewarded with the next block of Bitcoins. So there is a lot to making sure that your technology is as sophisticated as possible. And over the course of the last several years, it has, of course, become substantially more sophisticated in order to remain competitive. Now we get to the blockchain. Well, what is it? In its simplest form, a blockchain basically records information about cryptocurrency transactions, NFT ownership, smart contracts, all things that we're definitely going to discuss. It's essentially a shared ledger, which is duplicated across a network of computers or operators that we call nodes that exist on the network. And these are typically referred to, of course, as the miners. Now, once these transactions are recorded, they of course need to be ver excuse me, verified, and that's known as the block. And these new blocks or transactions, of course, are then added to a chain, ultimately unable to be changed or removed once created. And on the next slide, which I'm going to get to in a moment, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the characteristics of blockchain that would be helpful for your understanding here. But I want to briefly talk about the executive order that was just released by President Biden in March of this year. And what's impactful about this executive order is that it provides some semblance of a definition as to what all of these terms and concepts mean. So the executive order has laid out essentially that the digital assets in the blockchain system are theoretically just representations of value that are used to make payments or investments or to, as we say here, transmit funds that are issued or represented in digital form through the use of the distributed ledger technology or, of course, the blockchain. Next slide. Getting into some of the characteristics of blockchain, we have four characteristics that are laid out here. It's secured by cryptography. So the blockchain uses data encryption in order to make sure that the records are secured. And it's used in a decentralized network. That's a word that's often used. People often hear of this concept of decentralization, but what does that theoretically mean? Well, it means that the transactions are um, essentially stored on computers worldwide instead of in one main situation, uh, whether it be a financial institution, an Excel file, um, preventing any one person from gaining access or control to the specific currency network. So it's shared across all parties. It's also immutable. As I had mentioned previously, participants can trust the state of the network because the transactions were in fact verified and cannot be changed or edits cannot be made thereafter. And it's disintermediated. So no third parties are required to facilitate value transfers and it reduces unnecessary fees. So if you think about it in the context of your typical financial transaction, um, let's say you're going to buy a sandwich using a credit card. Well, that information needs to go through your credit card company, whether it's you know a bank for some um, particular credit card companies in order to verify the transaction and facilitate the transaction between party A, you, and party B, the vendor. You know, one interesting thing here is, and I got this from RSM, so I can't take credit for it, was they were explaining the first distributed ledger system from the island of Yap. And so there's this island of Yap where there are these huge rocks that are immovable, basically. And so, you know, Veronica might own one by the West River and Michelle might own one by the East River and they transact and they switch ownership of these different immovable rocks. And then collectively, the community, we keep track of who owns what rock, you know, on um, our own ledgers. So 
you know, RSM was, was it's interesting that they found like what I understand to be the first distributed ledger in the island of Yap. That's awesome. Thanks, Teresa. Cool. That's a good story. <laughs> I actually didn't cool. know that. <laughs> um, it also reminds me, I think, you know, just taking a step back globally, looking at this, I think a question that I get a lot is, you know, does blockchain really solve any problem? And I think the way that I see it is it actually, the creation of Bitcoin in particular um, allowed uh, the solution to a problem that hadn't, you know, people hadn't been able to solve before, which is transacting without a third party intermediary. So I don't have to know the identity of my counterparty in order to trust that our, we can transact together. Um, so that's always my answer to that question. I think it was pretty revolutionary in that respect. Um, and yeah, I think another revolutionary concept that we're gonna talk about next is smart contracts. So I actually, I was like, do I need to talk about smart contracts? Because I feel like once you start throwing in these terms, it starts to get confusing and we're doing a legal overview. And, but again, something someone asked me today was, do you really need to understand the tech to understand how the law applies? And I think as lawyers, if you're going to work in this space, uh, depending how deep you go, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, I think understanding the tech can be the difference between whether a law is applied uh, or how it will be applied. So just from a very high level, smart contract is a self-executing contract. That's what makes it smart, right? It, it quote unquote executes itself. Uh, it was ideated by Nick Zabo in the late nineties. And um, you know he gave the example of a precursor of a smart contract as a vending machine. So you have this vending machine, you don't need uh, a third party, um, but you do need certain inputs. You need to make the payment, you need to pay for the product and you need to tell the machine what, uh, what product you want. So once you put those two inputs in, you know, I mean, as long as the vending machine doesn't break, you're going to get your candy bar, or your uh, snacks. And essentially, uh, when we talk about smart contracts on the blockchain, we're talking about code that's stored on the blockchain and allows peer-to-peer -peer transaction um, in, in different ways, including in, in DeFi and, and other uh, innovations that we've seen over the years on, uh, in, in blockchain. Interesting. I didn't know that about the vending machine. <laughs> This is actually a really big area of, um, you know, interest in the, the legal industry and in the insurance industry, because it essentially makes, theoretically, our jobs more efficient. So from a cost benefit perspective, especially when it comes to our clients, smart contracts are absolutely being looked at as a potential alternative to ensure that transactions are effectuated in a more efficient manner. So for example, in the insurance industry, policyholders could theoretically get paid more quickly if we go through the use of smart contracts because we're able to automate claims payments in a more rapid way. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential opportunities for that. And moving on to NFTs, I think this is another word that's been in the cultural zeitgeist the past year, uh, really blew up during the past uh, pandemic years, although they were um, created uh, far before. Um, I was actually curious, I actually did look into this. We were talking before, I was like, I wonder if Merriam-Webster made this the word of the year. Merriam-Webster <laughs> didn't, but no. Collins Dictionary did. Oh. Merriam-Webster chose a vaccine. Oh, um, interesting. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so uh, NFT stands for non-fungible token. Uh, that's in contrast to fungible tokens, such as Bitcoin, where every Bitcoin can be replaced for another Bitcoin. With NFTs, every token essentially uh, contains an identifier that's unique. So you have that one token. It cannot be replaced with any other token uh, because it's unique, can't be divided. Uh, typically, it's associated with a media file. So a URL will point to a URL. And that media file, uh, you may have rights to the image. You may not. And that really depends on the rights that were granted when the NFT was minted. And so there's a lot of different legal issues that come up in this space, too. We'll be talking about. Uh, as part of this presentation, securities laws, um, regulations and enforcement from the CFTC, as well as FinCEN. Um, and so we just wanted to talk about some of these basic asset types and concepts just to set the tone. So when we start using the terms later, there's a little bit of a basis uh, for that. So, yeah, and I think and an, important, an important point here also for the securities laws and to consider with NFTs, I mean, there are there is like a single NFT that is unique in and of itself. And now there is new series NFT. So if you think mm -hmm. about a series of, of art, um, a series of portraits or something um, uh, that 
you know, there's like one through 99. And so they're all the same, but there's only 99. And so NFTs now have this one where it's just one, but then there's a series of NFTs. And then, you know, there's a question of how many in the series do you get to when, when it no longer really is, is non-fungible and it becomes fungible, right? So if you have a billion um, in a series, you know, then you're, you're kind of hitting more on the fungibility and you also get to fractionalize NFTs. So people are fractionalizing NFTs, which then kind of makes the, the fractionalized um, indivisible, or fractionalized parts of the whole NFT then more fungible. And so there's a lot of issues when we talk about fungibility where NFTs can actually become fungible rather than non-fungible. Yeah. And I think a good point on that too is this goes back to my why I'm really I feel strongly that understanding the tech is really required because what you you were talking about was different ERC token standards. And so the token standard, if you're working with someone and you don't understand the token standard, you may not be able to spot some of the more um, nuanced issues. And so I'm always available if anyone has questions about the tech. And uh, if I don't have the answer, I'm always happy to pass it along. But I think that passing along that knowledge in the space is really important. It is. I think yes, I you really do have to know the tech to be able to um, opine on the law. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm not going to go too deep into this because, you know, the different players in the ecosystem are going to be, you know, kind of a natural part of our conversation as we move on to the laws. But, um, you know, an entire economy has developed around these digital assets. So we have exchanges that help consumers um, or entities exchange cryptocurrency, custody cryptocurrency, lots of issues with security around that, OTC desks, helping facilitate large trades without moving the market or incurring slippage, payment processors, processors, cryptocurrency credit cards. We have people, you know, entities that are helping uh, convert value so people can buy goods and services. And then of course, cryptocurrency ATMs. Um, so these are some of the participants and laws will apply to all of them in similar different ways, depending on the activities that they're doing. Because remember a lot of, a lot of whether or not the law applies depends on the activities that you're engaging in and also how the digital assets are characterized. And we're also seeing a lot of this in the athlete space because many athletes across the MLB and the NFL, for example, are choosing to get paid in cryptocurrency. So, for example, the quarterback of the Jaguars, Trevor Lawrence, decided to have his entire rookie bonus, the $24 million, paid in cryptocurrency by pairing with Blockfolio. So there are many athletes that are also pairing with these exchanges, with these providers in order to get paid in digital assets. So it's really interesting to see how even the way that we get compensated for certain of our goods and services is being used in this way. That's interesting, yeah. It's catching on everywhere. It is. <laughs> okay, it is. so this is really just an example. I'm, again, I'm not gonna go too deep into this, but really talking about uh, one application of smart contracts and then two really looking at the potential, um, one of the defining characteristics of cryptocurrency, which is it allows peer to peer transactions without a third party intermediary. So we have the centralized financial system and there's centralized components too of the digital currency and digital asset ecosystem where in order to engage with someone like the, I think the most common example is using Western Union to send money from the United States to Central America. Shifting that to, uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer systems, I can now make that transaction without the third-party intermediary, you know, abstracting that a little bit more, we go to DeFi, where you can um, actually go into the next slide, you've got people interacting with each other and with pools of liquidity, where you can uh, lend an asset and then receive an interest-bearing token in return, uh, you can also add to the liquidity pool by posting collateral and getting a different type of cryptocurrency in return. I think the biggest question with that is, well, if you're borrowing something, why do you have to put up collateral? You may not want to swap out of your uh, one of your assets, for example. Uh, so you uh, post it as collateral, borrow a different type of asset. Um, so you can maybe you want to use the asset without incurring a taxable event, for example. And so it's a lot of activity uh, in this space. And I think um, it it, how the laws are applied here um, are in some regard an open question, but definitely some interesting legal issues in this space. So, well, it's definitely helpful because it prevents barriers to entry. So, for example, in the altcoin space, and we have a lot of altcoins on the screen, of course, there is a ton of staking. Um, occurring because it allows for participants to gain passive income without needing to sell their actual holdings. So in essence, it allows for people who want to participate in the market but don't necessarily have the money to 
have more opportunities than they would like to have more access to these tokens than they otherwise would, which is very nice. You're seeing a lot of the younger generation engaging in staking as a consequence. Yeah, that's true. You are seeing that. Um, and I guess, you know, when you think about the these different regimes, so we've oftentimes, you know, um, needed and require these third party intermediaries. And so there's all these laws, you know, to protect consumers or investors, um, and they apply generally to third party intermediaries often uh, to protect investors. So now that you have this decentralized uh, network, it's, you know, how, how do you integrate those protections with this regulatory regime? So speaking of the regulatory regime, um, so the, the United States regulatory regime over you know, digital assets generally is, is both fragmented and overlapping. And so you know, a cryptocurrency, it could be considered currency, a commodity, a security, or property. And then depending on how it is, um, how it's classified, because it depends on the specific facts and circumstances, it has a different regulatory body that oversees, um, th that regulates it and oversees it. Um, and as for the enforcement regime, the re enforcement regime is also likewise overlapping. Um, and so, you know, from, you have the Department of Justice that has federal jurisdiction over civil and criminal conduct. Um, and then you have the SEC, which has jurisdiction over the federal securities laws, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the CFTC, which um, has jurisdiction over commodities and derivatives and similar products and, and regulates um, under the Commodities Exchange Act. And then you have Treasury, which has several different divisions that, that have enforcement powers. So whether it's the IRS or um, FinCEN or OFAC, um, these agencies all have their own enforcement authority and can impose you know, different types of fines and, and penalties, um, and also can refer things to the Department of Justice. So you will see matters where you have parallel civil and criminal cases ongoing. Um, given this really kind of overlapping and fragmented jurisdiction, you know, industry participants have been very vocal in how difficult it can be to try and comply with all of these different jurisdictional requirements. So there's instances, for example, where, <clears throat> you know, a, a swap, um, depending on what the underlying asset of the swap is, could be considered a commodity or could be considered a security. And there are instances where, you know, we've gone forward and talked to both um, agencies and they both have taken the position, the CFTC took the position it was a commodity, the SEC took the position it was a security, which is quite a predicament for, for the clients, right? Because you can't comply with both regulatory regimes. And so you would have to choose which regulator to ignore and which regulator to listen to. Um, so I think it's really important that we continue to go forward and work on, you know, how these can be better, you know, streamlined in a comprehensive regulation. And we saw the with the executive order that President Biden recently issued, where he called on federal on, on different agencies to, to evaluate and do studies um, to kind of come up with where they thought the regulatory enforcement would be under their jurisdiction. And you know, the industry hope is that from this executive order and all the directives they're in, and that more of uh, ideas for a more comprehensive, streamlined um, regulatory regime could be created. And this, we also saw this similarly with um, the recent proposed legislation. Yeah, so I think to Teresa's point, um, you know, it's informative to see how uh, lawmakers might view this. And I think we had a little insight in um, reading the Lumis Gillibrand um, proposed legislation. Uh, which was very comprehensive. I think as a first point, it defined a lot of these terms like digital asset, virtual currency, decentralized autonomous organizations, which we're not really going to go into as much at all today. Um, but some of these terms that you know can feel a little more amorphous and um, essentially can change over time as people start to understand them a little bit more. Um, it also would provide uh, the CFTC, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, with more potentially more oversight, at least over some of the digital assets. Um, so, I mean, you know, 
created this term ancillary assets, which would kind of uh, touches on what is it, what is a virtual currency or token that's released in association with an underlying security. Um, so a lot of kind of interesting looks at this and um, although I've been told from our people on our policy team that it's probably not going to pass, but uh, it's still, in, in, you know, digging into it, it's, it's interesting to see um, how lawmakers are looking at it and potentially how um, things could turn out in the future. Absolutely. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting that the SEC, that they came up with a new um, way, an entirely new asset, this ancillary asset um, idea. So I thought that was, that was not something that we really hadn't seen much before, which was kind of novel. And it will also be important to ensure that these agencies continue to work together as they historically have. What's really good is that the SEC is now being led by Gary Gensler, who is also the chair of the CFTC under the Obama administration. So he has a knowledge and appreciation of both agencies and both him and the chair of the CFTC have come out saying that they look forward to working together to figure out how to properly regulate these industries. So time will tell how this is eventually going to look. It definitely would take some, um, would be great to see see more coordination. Agreed. Um, with the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, so the SEC generally has a three-part mission. It's to promote investor protection, um, fair and efficient markets, and capital formation. And so in considering the SEC and its jurisdiction and what its purposes are, I think are important kind of as a, as a bedrock foundation. Um, so here we just have some statements. Um, there have been lots of statements, but here are some that we've chosen, um, dating back to former chair Clayton, you know, noting that generally tokens that are used to finance projects um, are generally securities. He says none that I've seen that aren't securities. Um, I know double negative, but I think you can track that. Um, he also indicated that Bitcoin, you know, the, the cryptos that he saw as replacing the dollar, the euro, the yen uh, would not be a security. So that was kind of an important statement. Um, former, um, former division of corporation finance director Hinman, he made a statement that Ether are not securities transactions, which has also been something that's been relied on heavily. Um, you know, obviously different directors come out different differently and different officials come out differently. And Commissioner Peirce, she proposed a safe harbor. This was her own safe harbor, to be clear. This was not a commission safe harbor. It was just one simply by this one commissioner, um, which is unusual, uh, to provide some exemption for registration requirements um, for the securities laws. And Gensler has come out and similar to, to uh, former Chair Clayton and agreed you know, that he he basically sees that most tokens would likely be securities. And he's targeted more um, exchanges as well, indicating that the probability is quite remote that any given platform has zero securities. Um, and then, you know, there's frequently reference to it being the Wild West. And, um, you know, that if these exchanges are trading securities, that they would need to be um, registered with the SEC. So, we talk a lot about the SEC's jurisdiction and kind of its oversight and, and what that means. Um, and I think it, you know, it's important to understand that so the, the SEC regulates you know, basically securities transactions. And so what are securities? Securities are stocks and bonds and things like that. Um, and it also includes a term called investment contract. And so then what is an investment contract? So for the definition of an investment contract, which is a type of security, this, this definition and this test dates back to 1946 case, SEC versus Howey, um, which while it dealt with orange groves, you know, it's kind of analogous and the, and the um, test has been used for digital assets just the same. Um, FinHub, which we'll talk about a bit briefly later, uh, at so it's staff of the commission also released framework for the investment contract analysis of digital assets. So this is not a commission statement. Again, it's just one by the staff indicating that they do use the investment contract analysis um, for digital assets. So because there's various other types of securities like evidence of indebtedness, um, you know, it's important to recognize that the SEC staff has generally used the investment contract analysis. And so what is this test? So it's generally considered to be three parts. Some say it's four. Some have said it's two, but we're going to go with three. Um, so first, and it's an investment of money. 
So an investment of money could be fiat, it could be ether, it could be crypto, it could also be labor in some instances, it could be an airdrop in other instances. And so, you know, an investment of money could be more than what you're considering as just, you know, the US dollar or, or its equivalent um, fiat currency. The second is a common enterprise. And so this is both vertical and horizontal commonality and um, different courts apply a different standard. Some require vertical, some require horizontal. The SEC's framework has says that it doesn't necessarily think that either one is required. But for vertical commonality, think about it vertically from the, um, from the issuer to the purchaser and you know, with the rising and the falling of their profits together. With horizontal commonality, think about it as all of the purchasers together and whether there's like a pooling of assets, a pro rata distribution of funds or something like that. Um, the expectation of profit ba profits based on managerial or entrepreneurial efforts of others. So this is an expectation that you will you know, make money. If I buy it now and I hold it, I'll be able to sell it later for more money. But this is not based on market forces as you know the price of gold and silver goes up and down based on market forces. This is based on somebody else's efforts, what's, what's considered an active participant. So these are the significant efforts, the efforts that um, really make a difference in the management or in, in the operation of the um, enterprise. And it's not those administerial or minis sorry, ministerial or administrative efforts. So those are kind of the distinction. And some of these issues are, you know, whether there's protection, there's sufficient protection for investors in the crypto ecosystem generally. And so often we hear about decentralization and what, why decentralization is oftentimes important for the Howey test is because it goes to that, that third prong of expectation of profits based on the entrepreneurial or managerial efforts of others. And so if it's decentralized and the community is doing all of the activities itself, then it would be based on your own efforts and the community's efforts rather than some active participant, some manager, some, some team or something, some, somebody, some active participant in that way who is increasing the value of the token or of the digital asset. Um, and in that instance, if something is fully decentralized, is there anybody who actually has material non-public information who could, who could actually make disclosures? Because the issue here for the investor is whether there's information asymmetry. And so when a purchaser is not having the same type of information as, as other people who are in the know, you know of, of the enterprise or of the, of the um, token or digital asset, you know, there's that information asymmetry. And then similarly, you know, the SEC has talked about protections from the exchange point of view, the accuracy of disclosures. Of course, these are different types of disclosures. This is pricing information and holding information, um, whether they can trade when they need to. Um, we've seen instances where all of a sudden um, you can't, people aren't able to get any of their crypto out or, or you know, and so it's, do, or do they have that access to trade? Are the markets fair and efficient and orderly? And then there's the custody issue. And there's always a lot of issues around custody and we could have an entire CLE on custody, but we won't <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, when somebody else has custody of somebody else's assets. Um, and then generally with the enforcement that we've been seeing with the SEC, there's four broad categories. You know, There's unregistered coin offerings, which is a violation of section five of the Securities Act of 1933. Um, whether there's false and misleading statements, whether there's fraud or Ponzi-like type of behavior, or promoting an offering without disclosing a position, the, the anti-touting, which I'll talk about briefly next. So with the SEC guidance that we've gotten, um, you know, it's we have the, the first indication or the first guidance that we see is, you know, one of the most important is the Dow report. So this was a 21A report. So it's 21A under the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. And basically when the SEC sees some sort of industry action out there that it wants to opine on and say, this is how we consider this activity, you know, it's done it with social media or you know, the internet or whatever in the past, you know, it, it's basically an indication to the marketplace for them to know, to be on notice that they think certain conduct is, um, will be viewed by the SEC enforcement in a certain way. And so the Dow report basically was notice that digital assets could be securities. And then we saw the, the first action in Munchie, and that was basically look at the economic realities of the transaction, not what it's um, called. Just because you don't call it a security doesn't mean it's not. Anti-touting guidance. So 
you know, <clears throat> if you are going to be promoting a security, and there's other laws too that apply in, in, outside the securities context, but if you're promoting or touting something and you have some sort of financial interest or you're getting paid to do so, then that's something that you, you need to disclose. The FinHub framework, which we already discussed, and then um, SAB 121, which is where the, um, the SEC staff expressed its views about the accounting obligations to safeguard crypto assets that are held by platform users. Held, I'm sorry, on behalf of platform users. Um, so the recent kind of, the recent uh, movement and expansions that we've seen in the SEC, um, we've seen the expansion of the crypto assets in, in cyber unit. So that was earlier this year, um, the SEC announced um, the expansion of its crypto asset and cyber unit was formerly the cyber unit um, to 50 staff members. Um, and in June, there were some media reports indicating that the SEC had launched an inquiry into whether crypto exchanges have sufficient protections against insider trading on their platforms. Um, this seemed to come from a case that Michelle is gonna talk about briefly in a little bit. And some of the more notable cases that we just wanted to highlight, um, there's the SEC versus Shin case. So here the SEC filed an emergency, an emergency action to get an asset freeze against Virgil Capital LLC and affiliated companies. And Baker Hostetler is counsel, has been appointed counsel to the receiver by the US District Court and is currently in the process of marshaling assets for that. Um, that's a scheme in which the, um, the defendant Shin also had a criminal action against him. And he pled guilty to securities fraud and is currently incarcerated. Um, there's SEC versus Kick, um, and in that case, uh, the court granted the SEC's motion for summary judgment, holding that basically the SAFT, um, so the simple agreement for future tokens, and the public token offering were two integrated offerings. Um, and so the motion for summary judgment, basically there is no genuine dispute of a material fact. And so the judge, the judge made a ruling based on the law. Uh, SEC versus Telegram. <clears throat> Here the court granted the SEC's motion for preliminary injunction in which the SEC met its burden to show that it had a likelihood of success on the merits. Here the court implemented a different theory. This was the single scheme theory and it held that basically it was a long, single continuous offering from the SAFs through the delivery of the TON and continue to into the um, sales in the secondary market. And then finally, Ripple is still ongoing and there the SEC is, um, is, is arguing again, the single scheme theory. That's a case that's being greatly watched by mostly everyone in the cryptocurrency space right now. So it'll be interesting to see what ultimately results from that case. I agree. I agree. And here is your CLE code, Baker1, no space, B-A-K-E-R-1. Okay. Uh, so, you know, the other um, agency we've talked a lot about uh, leading up to this is the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Um, as was sort of highlighted, I think we can go on to the next slide, um, before the, you know, one of the questions is, you know, uh, we work with different people in this space. Is this, is this a security or is this a commodity? Uh, there's not always a clear answer to that. Um, and as Teresa was um, indicating, um, the agencies might both view uh, an asset as under its um, regulatory regime. So um, essentially the CFTC regulates transactions in commodities and derivatives, futures and options. Um, and Commodity is broadly defined. On the one hand, there's an enumerated list of agricultural commodities, and then we have this all other goods and articles, all services and rights and interests in which contracts for future delivery are presently or in the future dealing. So what we've seen is that, um, I mean, the CFTC has enforcement um, authority over uh, spot market transactions. So transaction, consumer transactions um, in uh, digital currencies, um, that are, are fraudulent or engage in manipulation. Uh, regulatory authority expands over categories of derivatives transactions. Um, uh, so the scope is a little bit uh, potentially more narrow than uh, what the SEC is looking at. Um, commodities, uh, you know, traditionally are fungible, but that's not a requirement. 
Um, what we've seen from CFTC staff guidance as early as 2014 is that Bitcoin uh, is a commodity. Um, Ether is likely considered a commodity um, and uh, as well as some other digital assets. So, you know, kind of looking back to that, the Loomis Gillibrand bill, for example, looking at to where lawmakers might be deciding who has more authority over certain types of assets is still a little bit of a question, but I think that over the next few years, we'll potentially see a little more clarity on that front. Yeah, and certainly the SEC has agreed that Bitcoin is in fact a commodity, but it is yet to provide any further guidance on when, whether any other tokens are also a commodity. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah, um, and so... Just, yeah. <laughs> um, the, yeah. The one thing that I do want to mention briefly, um, because of course I, I worked for the Chicago Merck and the New York Merck, um, so I worked closely with both House and Senate Ag because those are the committees with jurisdiction over these exchanges, um, is that because House and Senate Ag have a traditional purview over these exchanges and work closely with the CFTC, you're also seeing guidance come out of the agriculture committees in the Congress when it comes to cryptocurrency. So for example, in January of this year, the committee sent a letter to the CFTC chair concerning the regulation of cryptocurrency, which is something that you wouldn't think would come out of House or Senate Ag, but because that's traditionally where the regulation has lied, that's what we're dealing with here. Yeah, that's super interesting, Michelle. Thanks. Um, yeah, and as I was mentioning, the CFTC as early as 2014, actually, uh, in a committee meeting, a uh, staff member um, referenced cryptocurrency, um, Bitcoin as a commodity, and then in the 2015 settlement order with CoinFlip, uh, we saw that uh, asserted again, uh, that definition of commodity is broad, and Bitcoin and other virtual currencies are properly defined as commodities. So there's been other CFT oversight activity, um, and, you know, again, it's been more around uh, the derivatives or futures um, aspect of these digital assets, so. All right, the Department of Justice, next slide. So the DOJ has made clear that its priority here is coordination amongst international law enforcement. And they were the first to respond to President Biden's executive order. Not too long ago, it issued a report responding to that executive order calling for federal agencies to assess digital asset risk and opportunities. And this includes increased cooperation among international law enforcement agencies, which includes expanding US relationships and information sharing and addressing jurisdictional enforcement gaps. So for example, the DOJ is concerned about you know, criminal actors engaging in jurisdictional arbitrage because they want to take advantage of certain regulatory inconsistencies because some jurisdictions don't even have any regulations whatsoever. So the DOJ wants to focus its efforts on trying to bridge those gaps. Um, they're also looking at certain crimes that capitalize on digital assets that um, should be a focus of their enforcement, extortion through cryptocurrency ransomware payment demands, facilitation of purchases and sales of illicit items, hiding the source of criminal proceeds and criminal identities, and of course, funding terrorism and circumventing sanctions regimes. These are all issues that they're very much focused on and looking at because there are certain characteristics that the DOJ has essentially noted that have been exploited by criminals. So they've been able to use these as tools to really focus in on what they need to concentrate on. So we're looking at these individuals being able to effectuate their crimes on an anonymous basis or a pseudo anonymous basis using obfuscation tools such as mixers or chain hopping or off chain transactions even and using instantaneous transfers that leverage the lack of cross border cooperation. Yeah, and just, you know, it's interesting, we, Veronica and I are actually, you know, certified with tracing um, digital assets and, and using blockchain analytics. And, you know, mixers can obfuscate things. So basically, you know, you put your, your crypto into a mixer and it gets jumbled up with everybody else's and then it comes out. But, you know, there are some really amazing tools out there where you're, it, it does really facilitate the tracing of it, even through mixers and tumblers, which, you know, do have a similar kind of process. Well, um, uh, the other thing is on the flip side, like one of the characteristics that makes, you know, certain people want to use cryptocurrency for, uh, or leveraging these characteristics for criminal activities, there's characteristics that also make it uh, easier to trace. So to your example, like you can't, I don't know if you're gonna be able to trace the transfer of cash along similar lines from person to person, you can trace it on the blockchain, even if they're using some obfuscation techniques, and then you can see when it goes to a third-party exchange, eventually someone, if they ever want to use funds, is going to have to convert that to, 
uh, typically to uh, fiat or some other currency. So at that point, um, we, we saw that actually with the Bitfinex. Uh, that's how the, the people who had the funds from that Bitfinex ha uh, were caught. They tried to cash out and then, um, yeah, the government swooped in and saw that. So a little bit of balance there. In yeah. Those two things. Well, when you're coming off of um, off the blockchain at some point in time, often you're going to hit somewhere where KYC was done. Right. So. Yeah. Right, exactly. So the purpose that they're using these technologies for is eventually going to unravel because of those reasons. So those are very valid points. Um, the DOJ, much like the SEC, has created teams in order to focus in on these issues. So last year, for example, they created the NCET, the National Cryptocurrency Enforcement Team. And just this year, they created the Klepto Capture Task Force. I'm going to go through each of those briefly. So the NCET has the purpose of identifying, investigating, and supporting the DOJ's cases involving the criminal use of digital assets. They're focusing specifically on exchanges, mixing and tumbling services, um, infrastructure providers, and other entities that are enabling the misuse of cryptocurrency and those related technologies to facilitate criminal activity. The DOJ appointed its first director of the NCET, um, formerly of the Southern District, Yun Yong Choi, or EYC, as she goes by. In her role at the Southern District, she served as the cybercrime coordinator investigating and prosecuting cyber complex fraud and money laundering crimes. So she, as well as many of her other colleagues at Justice who have this incredible background in cyber crime and cryptocurrency and money laundering are all getting together and using their expertise expertise for cross purposes in order to track down this criminal activity. And then we have the Klepto Capture Task Force, which is relatively new, and it was created because of the Russian involvement in Ukraine. <laughs> um, and, and as part of that, um, the Attorney General has launched this task force, which in part because of what is happening abroad is seeking to target the use of cryptocurrency to evade sanctions and launder proceeds of foreign corruption. And the task force is essentially going to be empowered to use cutting edge technology in order to effectuate its purpose, particularly because we're looking at some international complications and international governments to go along with those complications. Next slide. So there has been a renewed focus from the Department of Justice on corporate crime, and this was very much the subject of the keynote address of Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco during the ABA White Collar Conference in October of last year. I'm going to go into a lot more of this later on. So just at a high level, the DOJ is looking at increased enforcement resources, such as surging resources to prosecutors, increased use of data analytics, and the failure to implement corporate compliance programs, according to the DOJ, will be costly. As far as the changes to the evaluation of corporate conduct, I'm going to be going into that in a bit more detail in a few slides, but we're going to be seeing much of a focus on past misconduct that relates to the current misconduct, providing information on all individuals involved in the misconduct, and the more frequent use of monitor monitorships as well. Next slide. So like the SEC, there's been a lot of enforcement by the Department of Justice. For example, we have BitMEX, where the founders and executives were indicted for BSA violations. The indictment alleged that the defendants failed to implement AML and KYC programs. They did, in fact, plead guilty for violating the BSA by failing to establish, implement, and maintain an AML program. And under the terms of their agreements, they each agreed to pay $10 million in a criminal fine, which represents a pecuniary gain derived from the offense. Then there's the Nguyen case, which I wanted to highlight specifically because the defendants in this case were 20 years old. And we're seeing a lot of this coming out of justice where the defendants are incredibly young. And it's due to the fact that people who tend to use this technology are of a certain generation. So here we have two 20 year old young men who were charged in a criminal complaint with conspiracy to commit wire fraud and conspiracy to commit money laundering in connection with a million dollar scheme to defraud purchasers of NFTs. And going quickly to OpenSea for the sake of time, this is a case about a former product manager 
who was indicted in connection with wire fraud and money laundering to commit, and I'm going to put this in quotes, insider trading of NFTs by using confidential information about when NFTs were going to be on the homepage of OpenSea. Now, the reason I put insider trading in quotes is because this case is actually more of a wire fraud and money laundering scheme case and not really insider trading because we don't have tipper, tippy liability, but a lot of media outlets have come out and said that because of the importance that this individual placed in the value of the NFT once it was on the homepage, there might be a lot of consideration as to whether an NFT is in fact a security. So there's been a bit of discussion on that in the media recently. Okay, so we're running a little short on time. So I'm going to give a high level view of uh, just some background on the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network and um, their role in this. So, um, you know, really looking at uh, I mean, as a first question initially, it's like, are these digital currencies, you know, does this make me a money transmitter? And, uh, you know, is this, if you look at, um, well, I guess I'll just start at the big question is, are you a money services business? Uh, within that, there's different enumerated types of um, those businesses. One is money transmitter, uh, which is a person that provides money transmission services or any other person engaged in the transfer of funds, what's money transmission services, you know, we go on in this definition, um, the, accept uh, the acceptance of currency, and I'm just going to fast forward to, or other value that substitutes for currency from one person to another. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And so the question was value that substitutes for other currency. And so FinCEN has come out and um, found that convertible virtual currency uh, is a type of virtual currency that does have the meet that the equivalent value is currency. So therefore, if you're engaging in um, money transmission services um, with with like a, in exchange digital assets that would qualify as money transmitter services, it's not always so clear uh, for all assets, you know, there's a question depending on what you're doing with NFTs, for example, if you're running an NFT exchange, do you have to register as a money transmitter? Um, and those are things that, you know, this test is codified as a facts and circumstances example uh, test. So it's something that you'd want to look at the whole um, situation to analyze. And then FinCEN's two 2013 and 19 guidance goes on to explain administrators and exchangers um, or type of virtual currency participant that does engage uh, in uh, money transmission versus a user, someone who's using virtual currency to purchase goods and services who's not. So just sort of a top level um, view uh, on that. Okay, so this is our second CLE code, Baker2, B-A-K-E-R-2, no spaces. All right. <laughs> okay, now we're going to talk about what happens when the regulators come for you, the purpose of why we are here. So let's go to the next slide and start with SEC sweeps. I'm going to go through this quickly because there's a lot to say in the following slides on what the SEC and the Department of Justice have been doing. So sweeps generally originate in either the SEC's Division of Enforcement or its Division of Examinations. And the general purpose of a sweep is to just gather information related to an industry-wide compliance area. Now I say industry-wide because we're not focused on a specific company or individual, but rather an industry as a whole. The sweep has to be for the purpose of gathering information on a company's operation or assessing the effectiveness of compliance programs, reviewing procedures and controls surrounding the production of documents and what have you. So it's more generalized than it is targeted to just get a sense of what's happening on an industry-wide basis. The sweep may be in response to information suggesting that numerous companies in an industry have violated the securities laws. And the subject line of these sweeps, again, is usually general and references to the initiative, such as, for example, the Paycheck Protection Program that we are very familiar with due to the COVID pandemic, um, cybersecurity related events, which was a huge focus of the SEC, um, rather than looking at a specific company, like I said. And in fact, in just the fall of this past year, the SEC was covered in the media purportedly contacted multiple banks to check whether they were adequately documenting employees' work-related communications. And we're talking about employees' personal devices, their personal cell phones, their personal email accounts. So it got to that specific level. Next slide. 
Okay, so SEC voluntary information requests, there's a lot of information on the slide, but I think um, the main takeaway is it's, I generally recommend viewing this as not so much voluntary uh, as, you know, if you receive a voluntary, voluntary information request from the SEC, this is something that you want to, uh, you probably want to retain an attorney for um, and, and look at the request and as part of this process, you have the opportunity to cooperate, I think, which is um, a term that you want to make your friend when you um, receive one of these requests. So in part of the cooperation, that can go both ways. Um, so if you uh, bring on someone like Teresa, who has a lot of background in this space, um, just understanding that there, there are ways where you can look at the requests and maybe at least in the beginning, narrow the request so you really have an opportunity to reduce your costs in answering this. and get a little more familiar with what the agency is looking for. Um, the, op the other alternative is to ignore it and punt it, um, but you potentially will then receive a not, definitely not voluntary uh, response later down the line with less opportunity for cooperation that's beneficial to you. So um, and so it's just, uh, that's, that's, I think, I think that summarizes most of what's on there, but, and oh, I also want to mention, I think just it's a general good practice too, even if it's a voluntary request issuing a lit hold, you know, if you're working with a company, just making sure that information is preserved and not deleted. Yeah, no, that's true. And I mean, once, when you do get an inf a voluntary request, it's important not to consider it really voluntary. And so mm -hmm. um, it's important to contact your attorney right away and you can come up with a way that you um, will be responding to it. And so the information, the voluntary information requests often come earlier in the stage of, a, of an SEC investigation. And so it's a matter under inquiry or investigation in MUI. And the voluntary information request comes at that point. And so it's generally speaking, it's before a formal order. And so the formal order is then when the SEC has subpoena power. And so this is kind of earlier in the investigation. And then your lawyer can have more of an interaction with the um, SEC uh, to try and, like Veronica said, narrow requests and things like that. And then when you do get to a subpoena, as you see on the slide, you know, whether it's from the SEC or the DOJ, um, you know, you'll also need to be responding to that. And there's two types of subpoenas, one for testimony and one for documents. And oftentimes at this stage, you're not sure, you don't know whether or not your role is one of a witness or you are being looked at more as, you know, a subject or in the terms of the DOJ, a target um, of the investigation. And when you're responding to these here, you know, we have some basic tips for you um, to respond. So for one, you want to hire a securities defense lawyer. So it's really critical, critical that you have an attorney who can help inform you about what's going on and um, what the process is and make sure that you comply with all of your obligations, um, including certain privileges. And so, you know, you need to understand what's considered privilege. So there's a difference here between what is protected by the company's privilege and what is company what is protected by an individual privilege. And you know, attorney-client privilege belongs to the client. So if the client is the company of the lawyer, then the company is the only one who has the ability to waive that or really has the right to waive that. The individuals don't. Um, and it is possible to waive it. Uh, and, and so you want to be cautious and talk to your lawyer about ways that you um, will not be waiving it. You can also waive certain protections like your Fifth Amendment right if you, even as simply as potentially giving a um, social media um, a handler name. And by doing that, that could be considered testimonial and you could be actually waiving your Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. So um, there's a lot of privileges here that are important to, to know the, the law on. Uh, you wanna read and, and understand the deadlines in the subpoena. So if you're called to testify or produce documents on a certain day, it would be best if you contacted your lawyer as soon as you got it and not the day that it's due. <laughs> Although many times we get calls the day or after it's due, uh, it makes it <laughs> a little bit more difficult. Yeah, but so, you know, understanding those deadlines, those are real deadlines. Um, and then, you know, you wanna begin outlining the tactics for production, which uh, Michelle will touch on. Um, which you'll work with, work with your lawyer, um, but basically production often entails, um, you know, imaging of devices and we run search terms and coming up with potentially responsive information. Um, don't discuss it with anybody other than your lawyer. So this is important because you can also, like I said, waive your privilege. 
And you can talk to your lawyer about how to communicate with your loved ones and significant other, you know, so you don't want to say my lawyer told me X, but there are ways you can communicate and get that kind of support you need without waiving your attorney client privilege. And then finally, an internal or independent investigation might be warranted. Um, and depending on the circumstances, you know, an independent, which is, you know, by the company or, or I'm sorry, internal, which is, you know, run from internal within the company to, or independent, which is generally an independent um, a subcommittee of directors of the board, which would be running the investigation. So the first thing that you need to do, as Veronica had mentioned, in the event that you receive a voluntary request or a subpoena is think about the preservation of evidence. So upon learning of that inquiry, it's incumbent on you to preserve the evidence that you have. And this means speaking with counsel and compliance personnel to create some form of a game plan, especially where company specific electronic documents and storage processes are in play. Um, you need to implement and communicate preservation obligations to all of the relevant parties, which is known as a litigation hold, and coordinate with the government to appropriately narrow preservation requests where possible. This is a situation in which things can get incredibly complex due to the nature of electronically stored information or ESI. So it's always important for you to speak with counsel on how to best tackle certain of these issues because it can get cumbersome and unwieldy. The other thing that you need to keep in mind is making sure your auditors are informed in the event that that is in fact relevant. So if the SEC is investigating, for example, keeping your independent auditors in the dark is never advisable because they very well may be part and parcel of this investigation. So for example, in an accounting investigation, the auditors will be concerned about the accuracy of the company's financial statements and whether they can continue to rely on the statements that they receive from company management or whether or not their prior audits are going to be subject to investigation, which means that they very well could receive a request for documents or even testimony. And we've seen that numerous times before Teresa and I. So keeping your auditors up to date on how the investigation is moving forward is always advisable and ensuring that the company is able to continue that great relationship so that you are continuously able to issue audited financial statements moving forward. So cooperation is something that is integral to both the SEC and the Department of Justice. Um, in the 2001 Seaboard Report, going through this quickly, identifies four broad measures of company cooperation, which helps from a cost benefit perspective on the SEC side because it saves them ultimately time and money in the long run. So why not step up to the plate and make the SEC's job easier? So we have self-policing prior to the discovery of misconduct, which means imposing, enacting, and implementing robust compliance procedures and setting the tone at the top. So for management downward, self-reporting misconduct when it's discovered, um, conducting a thorough review of the nature of that conduct. And I should mention that the matter of self-reporting is an art, not a science. So working with competent counsel is absolutely integral in navigating that process, especially when it comes to the remediation aspect. So dismissing or disciplining individuals, wrongdoers, um, modifying or improving internal controls is all part and parcel of how you can remediate the situation. And then when it comes to the cooperation with law enforcement authorities, providing commission staff with all information relevant to the underlying violations, including those remediation efforts, is absolutely integral. Um, all that said, the SEC did come in in 2010 to announce a series of measures to strengthen its enforcement program. This is more specific to individuals than it is to companies. So you want to look at the assistance provided by the cooperator, such as the value and nature of the cooperation that's provided by the individual, the importance of the underlying matter, the interest in holding the individual accountable. So for example, the cooperator's culpability, um, the culpability relative to that of other violators, for example, and the profile of that individual. Um, things that are considered are, for example, the individual's history of compliance, the opportunity for future misconduct, things like that are all part and parcel of this as well. And going to the DOJ, this really harkens back to the prior slide that I spoke on with respect to DAG Monaco's keynote address at the ABA White Collar Conference. So the DOJ has announced specific revisions to its corporate enforcement policies 
specifically that companies need to actively review their compliance programs to ensure they adequately monitor for and remediate misconduct because as the DOJ said, it's going to cost you down the line if it doesn't. Now for people that are facing investigations, as of now, the department is going to be reviewing the whole criminal, civil and regulatory record. So everything, not just a sliver of that record. So we're talking about going back in time to make a determination on how to proceed moving forward. And then for people who are cooperating with the government, including companies, there is a need to identify all individuals that are involved in the misconduct, not just those that are substantially involved. And you have to have them produce all non-privileged information about the involvement of their misconduct and, and, and the others that are involved in the misconduct. Now, this actually goes to an Obama era view on cooperation pursuant to the Yates memo. So this is a little bit different than what we saw under the Trump era, where we're looking at all individuals as opposed to, for example, those who are substantially involved. Um, for clients that are looking to negotiate resolutions, there is no there's um, no presumption against corporate monitors. That's made based off of the facts and circumstances of the case. And then finally, you know, just looking to the future, um, I have to say that this is probably the start of what the DOJ is going to be doing. Again, this is coming from just the fall of last year. So we're going to be seeing more coming out of the DOJ on this topic. And we realize we are running over, so we will quickly go over our top tips. So thank you so much for hanging on. Um, so first, ask for permission, not forgiveness. Uh, you probably will not get forgiveness from the SEC or DOJ, especially when it comes to digital assets. Um, so this is from a, a quote from my, my favorite chair, Harvey Pitt of the SEC, who, who said all good advice comes from the movies um, and wedding cra crashers when Vince Vaughn says to Owen Wilson, a friend in need is a pest. So this is get to know your regulator before you need them. Um, and you know, there's a lot of comments and everything out right now that the SEC is asking for. And so if you're just waiting for the government to tell you what it thinks and how you should be regulated, you know, don't be like Captain Renault in Casablanca and shocked, you know, that you don't like the answer um, because you probably won't. So, you know, participate in those processes where you can make your voice known and you can put your perspective out there. Um, a famous riddle, Abraham Lincoln is said to oppose to Stephen Douglas in the 1958 Lincoln-Douglas debates is, if you call a tail a leg, how many legs would a dog have, asked Lincoln. Why five, said Douglas. No, said Lincoln, it would still have four. Calling a tail a leg does not make it one. So just because you say it's not a security doesn't mean it's not. Um, if everyone else jumped off a bridge, it doesn't mean you should. So just because everyone else is doing it doesn't mean you won't get sued by the government and lose. Uh, Trust but verify is one of my favorite President Reagan quotes. And it's pretty sound advice in all business dealings and commercial transactions and you know investor accreditation, but also Confirming information before presenting it to the government with your stamp of approval, um, making sure that it's you verify it's true and correct. Um, <clears throat> Yogi Berra gives some great advice. He says, you've got to be careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, in launching a network, um, often important factor is whether the network is fully functional upon launch and prior to any distribution of token. And once you distribute those tokens as securities, then you're in a world of trying to morph into a, a non-security rather than starting initially as a security. So also as Yogi Berra said, sometimes we made too many wrong mistakes and sometimes you can't uh, remediate. It's dangerous to play a game without knowing the rules. So when the government sends you requests or makes an inquiry, you would be well advised to have an attorney engage, engage with the government on your behalf and help you comply with all your obligations. And don't gamble without knowing the stakes. Um, when you're involved in an investigation, your actions and decisions are gambles. And you should speak to a lawyer to know the pros and cons and consequences for decisions and actions and non-actions. All right, and that brings us to the grand finale, the first official Baker Hostetler NFT designed by, well, me, um, because not only am I an enforcement <laughs> attorney, I am apparently an artist. So this is in fact NFT that we're going to be giving out to the first 10 people that sign up for our webinar. So thank you to them and to all of you for joining us today. With respect to CLE credit, you're going to receive a survey that will 
likely be emailed to you. Please make sure to answer all of the questions, including your bar number and the state in which you are licensed or where you're looking to obtain CLE. I do want to thank you all for joining us today. It has been a true pleasure. I hope you learned something. I look forward to our next webinar. And of course, I do want to thank very much Teresa and Veronica, who have been nothing but phenomenal colleagues in this presentation and, and throughout. So thank you all for joining. We really appreciate it. Thank you.